This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce, well, if you need to be introduced, but in, just in case, um, Dr. Nathan Elkins joined the ANS in August 21. So it's uh, quite some time ago now as a visiting research scholar and then deputy director. Um, pre, I mean, prior to this position, he was an associate professor of art history, Greek and Roman, uh, and director of the Old Britain Art Institute at Baylor University. Other former posts include the directorship of undergraduate. Sorry, sorry. Um, I had a phone call at the same time. Sorry. <laughs> include the directorship of undergraduate research and scholarly achievement at Baylor University, a postdoctoral appointment in the Department of Coins and Medals at the Yale University Art Gallery, and um, at the Institute for Archaeologische Wissenschaften at the Goethe University at Frankfurt. Um, Nathan has published several books. He has huge knowledge of um, Roman numismatics and has been involved as well with excavation and archaeological activities and has been a frequent speaker, um, you know, at the Society of Antiquaries in London, uh, the Archaeological Institute of America, etc, etc, etc. So without further ado, um, it's your turn, Nathan. Uh, today I'll be talking uh, about on the topic of the Roman Emperor Nerva uh, in his guise as a military commander. And uh, you see there's part one in the title because this is the first of a three-part series I'm going to do on this um, rather under understudied emperor. Um, let's see if I can advance the slide. There we go. So um, if you have specific interest in Nerva, you'll see uh, here's the schedule we have for the subsequent talks. So um, on April 5th, I'll talk about uh, coin types of Nerva that relate to the Senate and the people of Rome and Italy. And then uh, we'll conclude with part three um, on May 31st with Nerva and the Roman Empire. Uh, and these will focus on the more broader and generic messages communicated through the personifications on Nerva's coinage, which I think are actually very important, even though personifications until the last couple of decades haven't gotten a whole lot of attention um, in numismatic research. So um, <clears throat> anyway, just to, I'll tell you how I came to this project and also note that um, uh, these three long table sessions draw upon the three core chapters of my book on Nerva, uh, which was published by Oxford and um, if you're interested in Nerva, uh, you can pick up the book for a 30% uh, discount using the discount code you see there. Um, but to tell you how I came to this project and why I chose Nerva, because you know I think he might not be an obvious choice for a lot of people uh, studying Roman imperial coin iconography, uh, it all started back when I was working in Frankfurt uh, during the period of my dissertation. Um, and one of the visiting scholars there was Flair Kemmers, um, and this institute in Germany had already been uh, well known for the study of coin finds. Uh, they had published the Fundmunzen der Antike um, volumes uh, that are well known in Germany, the coin finds registries, and done a lot of very innovative uh, research on coin, uh, coin finds and coin circulation. And um, as I said, Flair Kemmers was uh, working there at the time uh, as a visiting scholar. She's now a professor there. Uh, and she had just finished her dissertation on um, the coin finds from Nijmegen. And one of the things that she pointed out was that uh, the legions there were appear to have been deliberately supplied with coins that had uh, martial iconography that related to themes of victory and peace, uh, whereas coins from neighboring civilian settlements or from Rome had much lower frequencies of those kinds of images. So this suggested that the Romans supplied uh, coinage to different 
populations based on the re relevance of this. And so her work um, really kind of highlighted the Flavian period. Other studies have highlighted um, the Trojanic periods. And so I thought it would be really interesting at some point after I published my own dissertation on architectural types uh, to write a book on the coinage of an emperor and to um, interrogate both the frequency of images according to finds and also um, where those coins were found uh, according to finds and see if there was any evidence for targeting. And so Nerva made a lot of sense for a couple of reasons. That is one, um, he's between the Flavians and Trajan where you already have evidence of audience targeting, so makes sense. And two, um, he was only around for 16 months, and so even though he has a diverse range of types, it's also a manageable uh, data set. Um, also, he's not really been the subject of a whole lot of scholarly interest outside of how he relates to the so-called succession crisis after the death of Domitian and the ultimate uh, naming of Trajan as Nerva's heir. He's often viewed as a placeholder. Um, and so as I really started doing this research, I also found that not only could I study these questions of frequency and audience and so on, but basically also discovered that I had to reinterpret um, the imagery uh, on his coins because uh, historians who have uh, traditionally studied nervous coinage have uh, imposed these very negativistic readings on the imagery on his coins uh, because of um, military tensions and anxieties that um, were dominant throughout his reign. So, um, and of course, uh, if you study Roman art, you know that any kind of state art, which includes the coins, is not going to present the emperor in a negative light, even though this is how um, historians have bizarrely interpreted his coinage for the past couple hundred years or so. Um, also, it's very important, I think, uh, to study his coinage because the coinage gives us a contemporary glimpse of how he was presented to the public during his own lifetime, whereas our historical sources, uh, our literary sources are written after his uh, death, and um, they generally portray him positively, but, you know, ancient historians, Roman historians were not um, necessarily aiming to be objective the way that modern scholarly history works as a discipline, um, even though, you know, we're not always objective as we strive to be uh, as well. But, um, you know, for example, an author writing in the reign of Trajan will praise Nerva, but he will also point out shortcomings and weaknesses uh, because doing so also emphasizes how great Trajan is, for example. So there's a literary conceit there that governs um, the writing. And also the coinage is in the absence of any big building or sculptural program because Nerva didn't live long enough to have much of that. The coinage gives us the best uh, visual evidence for the way he was presented to the public during his own lifetime. Uh, so, so as I said, when I got started with this, uh, there was a lot of uh, monotonous work of going through all of the different coin finds inventories to create a database of hordes and single finds, single excavated finds, of where his various coin types were found, uh, so that I could run the numbers and think about how frequently frequent uh, different types were compared to a, a, a one another, and also uh, if, consider if any, any imagery was targeted to one geographic population or group of people versus another. Uh, I won't talk too much about audience targeting or geographical distribution of finds today, uh, but um, we'll do that more in subsequent lectures. I also just want to note that um, you often hear um, that Roman coins can be found anywhere, imperial coins circulated all over the empire, um, but this is not really accurate. Remember that uh, 
Of course, there are locally circulating types like the Roman provincial coinage or, you know, sometimes regionally circulating types, but even in the imperial coinage, um, there, there are places where certain types can be found and are not found. And if you really get into coin find studies, you start to see these patterns. And this is particularly the case with bronze coinage, small change. Once it was direct uh, introduced into a region, it didn't really circulate out of that region. So this is what Flair Kemmer's study on the Flavian coins from Nijmegen, for example, explored was the, uh, uh, the, the bronze coins that were supplied to the legions and then stayed in that region after they were introduced. So here's just kind of an overview of the types we'll talk about uh, today. Uh, these are all pretty rare types, except for the Concordia Exercitum type. Um, but uh, we'll kind of just go through these one by one. And uh, just to say a little bit more about Nerva, if you have, uh, uh, or if you're not very familiar with this emperor, uh, as I said, he often gets overlooked in big historical studies and so on. Um, often viewed as a placeholder since he didn't live very long, but he was emperor from the 18th of September of 96 to January uh, 27th, 98 CE, so that's just about 16 months. Um, he was named emperor um, after the assassination of Domitian, uh, who was no friend of the Senate, and um, that, but uh, he was appointed, uh, well, prior to being emperor, he was a close friend and advisor, we know, to the Roman emperors Nero, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. And this may be one of the reasons he uh, became emperor, was because um, the assassination of Domitian really kind of seemed to have uh, frayed uh, the Roman factions. Uh, the Roman Senate hated Domitian, for example. Um, the military, the general soldiery really loved Domitian. Uh, if we trust Suetonius, the people were pretty indifferent. Um, so um, selecting Nerva, who was by all means a, a Flavian loyalist, but also came from this well-respected, he was a well-respected a senator from a distinguished uh, senatorial family, um, he was someone who could be accepted by the Senate, by the commanders, and um, and uh, the people who who maybe could care less. Again, if we tr uh, trust the historical sources, so acceptable to a wide group of people. Uh, he was also possibly selected because he had no children. Uh, and then about a year into his reign, uh, he was, um, uh, he selected the popular general Trajan uh, to follow him as his successor. So uh, at the beginning, I alluded to uh, how historians have often really approached Nerva uh, in terms of the military anxieties that um, seem to have plagued his reign. Um, so again, these posthumous historical sources really kind of uh, allude to this over and over again. And so here um, in Pliny's Panegyricus, which I quote at the top here, I'll just read it to you. The great blot on our age, the deadly wound inflicted on, inflicted on our realm, was the time when an emperor and father of the human race was besieged in his palace, arrested and confined, from the kindest of elderly men was snatched his authority to preserve mankind. From a prince was removed the greatest blessing of imperial power, the knowledge that he cannot be forced against his will. What this refers to is um, about a year into his reign, in the summer of 97, um, the Praetorian Guard, the imperial bodyguard, surrounded Nerva in his palace and demanded that he deliver up the conspirators who had uh, assassinated Domitian, because remember, the general soldiery really loved Domitian. And uh, when Nerva came to power, he dismissed the Praetorian commander that had conspired against 
Domitian and replaced him with his own commander, but now this commander was rebelling against him and demanding um, those people who were involved so that they could execute them. And uh, so Nerva eventually had to capitulate to this demand, but it really just de demonstrated his vulnerability uh, to armed, source, uh, armed forces and really his, uh, even just the disrespect of his own uh, bodyguard at that time. Um, Trajan later got vengeance when he became emperor. He summoned uh, uh, this Praetorian commander to his capital in Cologne, where he was um, uh, governor of Upper Germany and um, dispensed with him, which we assume means executed them. Uh, but um, then the second quote here just tells you about the how everyone reacted to Domitian's death. The people received his, uh, news of his death with indifference. The soldiers were greatly aggrieved and at once attempted to call him the deified Domitian. Um, while they were prepared to avenge him, that is, that they would go into civil war or rebellion, had they not lacked leaders. So the, what we understand this to mean is that the commanders supported Nerva, but not necessarily the general sol soldiery. Um, so one of the uh, first types to refer to um, the armed forces in uh, Nerva's reign is an adlicutio type. Um, adlicutio, of course, meaning address, and what it seems to represent is Nerva's presentation to the Praetorian Guard, again, this imperial bodyguard in the city of Rome. And so on the coin, you can see Nerva standing on a platform with his arm raised in a gesture of address and speaking to the crowd of soldiers. Uh, and you can also see the crenellation of the Praetorian camp giving us the set setting here so we know exactly where this is happening in the Praetorian camp in the city of Rome. <clears throat> now, I want you to, uh, uh, this was struck in the first months of his reign, so it's in the first emission, September 96. Uh, but I want you to look here at how this is kind of interpreted by one scholar who has uh, um, studied nervous coinage and published on them, uh, Schotter. He, he, he calls this type an attempt to pacify the Praetorians. That is, Nerva is trying to pacify and appease the Praetorians here, is the assumption, because uh, Nerva uh, theoretically was not popular with the general soldiers, according to the historical stud sources that we all study. Um, but this is a bit anachronistic, because remember, this coin is struck in September 96. The Praetorians do not openly um, disrespect Nerva and surround him in his palace until a year later in the summer of 97. Um, and we have no evidence that uh, there was any problem with the Praetorians before this time. So it's, a, a, as I said, an anachronistic kind of reading. Also, um, as numismatists, we all know that this type is traditional. And uh, we have them on the coins of Caligula. We have an adlicutio on the coins of Caligula, on the coins of Ner Nero, on the coins of Galba. Uh, so there is really nothing out of the ordinary um, of this from this coin either. And we don't have to read it in this kind of negative way of attempting to pacify one faction or the other. Um, Another reason this type might have appeared, uh, we have no, no particular reason to, to believe why it appeared one way or the other, but uh, some scholars have posited that uh, Nerva may have been proclaimed emperor by the Praetorians before the Senate had the opportunity to actually name him. And this happened a few times throughout the first century where the Praetorians famously acclaimed Claudius before the Senate confirmed it. Uh, they also acclaimed Nero before the Senate confirmed it. And they also uh, acclaimed Domitian before the Senate um, uh, confirmed it. 
Uh, it could also refer to the payment of a donative, a gift, a monetary gift to the uh, Praetorians, which we know Nerva gave at the beginning of his reign. Um, and of course, uh, Galba, uh, who after the first dynasty collapsed, the Julio-Claudian dynasty, this had been this monetary payment had been promised to the Praetorians, but he never uh, gave it, and that was one of the key factors which led to Galba's own downfall. So. Uh, this could could refer to Nerva's payment or promise of a donative as well. We just don't really know. Um, anyway, those donatives were standard and have nothing to do with any unique attempt on Nerva's part to pacify the Praetorians. Um, the reason I'm not showing a coin of this type to you is because it is incredibly rare. We do not have one in the ANS collection. Uh, up, in, at, up until the time I wrote my book, there was only one known, and that's the one in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And um, um, another one subsequently appeared on the market and is owned privately. Um, so there's really only two that I know of in existence. Um, Here's another type uh, that was struck during Nerva's reign, uh, depicting uh, victory on the reverse. And she only appears on quinarii on Nerva's coinage. So quinarii are gold uh, fractions, uh, gold or silver fractions, either of an aureus or a denarius. Nerva had both gold quinarii and um, the, uh, yeah, gold quinarii and silver quinarii. Uh, we don't have any of these in the ANS, and again, they're very rare. Um, he struck them on his accession and then also on the occasion of his, um, his subsequent consulships. Um, and I want you to read here again uh, how uh, this imagery has been interpreted. Um, this imagery of victory has been uh, characterized as Nerva... Uh, Nerva's need to capitalize on military victories or to flatter the armed forces because Nerva himself um, did not have a military background and was in a weak political position. Uh, and you can see the various scholars who have uh, ascribed that, um, that uh, interpretation to this. And this is why it's important to be familiar with uh, coinage more generally and the history of imagery on coinage before making such conclusions, because um, if you've read Kathy King's book on Quinary, for example, you know that the standard image that appears on a Quinarius is victory. Uh, and in fact, since the age of Augustus, victory appeared on Quinary. And so you can see here, I'm just showing you one example, a Quinarius of Domitian that shows a victory on it. Um, you could see it in the context of contemporary military victories in Domitian's reign, but, you know, it's not this kind of apologetic, I'm a weak emperor, please um, see me as more, more militaristic or more martial than I am. Uh, again, this was just related to the denomination. And if we do want to view it more in contemporary activity, uh, we do know that Nerva was, in fact, or Ner the armed forces, even before Nerva came to power, were already engaged in military campaigns in Pan Pannonia and along the frontier. And so these could also uh, call those to mind. But as I say again, um, this, this image on this type had been standard for 100 years. Uh, I also want to remind that even though Nerva had no military background himself, many emperors did not have military backgrounds or substantial military backgrounds themselves. Um, nonetheless, he was, by virtue of his role as emperor, the supreme military commander. This is what was expected of an emperor, and he was presented in a martial way. And... Um, so you can see here uh, this statue from Mycenaeum, equestrian bronze statue from Mycenaeum, uh, which originally depicted Domitian, but of course after Domitian was assassinated, someone went and cut the face off and replaced it with the face of Nerva. 
and uh, you see he's wearing military armor and everything. Um, people studying this statue believe that uh, the position of the arm suggests he was holding a hunting spear rather than a spear that you would use in battle. So this may be a hunt, but in Roman thought, this um, uh, presentation of an emperor as a hunter was analogous to um, the same kind of military virtue that one would express in battle. Another image you see on Nerva's coinage is Pax, the Roman personification of peace. And again, I'm not showing you a coin from the ANS collection because we don't have any of these uh, from Nerva's reign uh, showing the goddess peace. And that is because they are relatively rare. Uh, I think I wrote this in my notes. It looks like I did not. Um, but the, the personification of peace on the Sesterci, that's where she appears on Nerva's coinage, she makes up about 7% of what was in circulation according to single finds and hoards uh, that I've studied um, uh, in, the, in the course of that database. So uh, not overall a significant communicator if you think of other types that were much more common uh, in Nerva's reign. Um, and here at the top, this first bullet point, you can see the different ways that this image has been interpreted by scholars. Um, the hope, peace, uh, peace is the hope that there will not be a civil war. Peace is the plea for the peace with the Praetorian guards, you know. Um, peace is an aspiration because um, it's a, uh, again, there's the anxiety of civil war. Peace indicates a good relationship between Nerva and the Senate. Um, peace celebrates, uh, Pax celebrates peace between Nerva and the Roman people. Um, there is nothing unusual I want to emphasize about Pax appearing on the Roman imperial coinage. Uh, first of all, peace in Roman thought is related to the image of victory. Um, you know, today I think we often, th as modern people, we think of peace as the opposite of war. Uh, peace is what you have when you don't have war. The Romans thought of peace very differently. Peace is, what is the natural outcome of successful military victory. So you can only get through peace through preemptive conquest, for example. So peace is what comes after uh successful military campaigns um and why she appears on nervous coinage doesn't have anything to do with anxieties of civil war or uh, pleading for peace uh and con concord with the praetorians or anything like that it is in fact a very standard image and she often appears when a new emperor takes power. It's just one of these images we tend to expect in the uh, first and second century when uh, a transition takes place. Um, and I just highlight some examples here. Um, peace, the personification of peace appear, appears famously on the Denarii of Ti Tiberius. Um, we see it on uh, coins of Vespasian, various other emperors, but also, we see peace appearing on the accession emissions of um, Titus and Domitian, both of which were peaceful transitions. So when Vespasian took power, or died, his son Titus took power, and peace appears on the coins. Same thing when Titus dies and his brother Domitian takes power, peace appears on the coinage. It's part of uh, the kind of standard iconography of uh, transition of reign, whether it's a violent transition or a peaceful transition. And even after Nerva dies, you see a Cistercius here of Trajan um, depicting peace in 98, immediately after Nerva dies. So we don't have to read these apologetic interpretations of this image on Nerva's coinage when it's tr completely traditional and appropriate and standard in terms of numismatic iconography. Now, what I want to conclude with are uh, the Concordia Exercitum types of Nerva. 
and here I can actually show you a couple in the ANS collection. So if we can switch to the camera, I guess I need to stop my screen share. So yes, we've got the camera here, and you can see uh, this beautiful aureus of Nerva uh, from uh, 96. I believe this might be his accession emission. Let me just look at the obverse here. Yes, that's his accession. So this is September 96. There's your portrait of Nerva. Um, but the legend reads Concordia Exercitum. This means harmony of the armies or har harmony among the armies or the armed forces. And you can see this, these clasped hands, the shaking hands. And behind the clasped hands, you have a military standard with an eagle at the top. Uh, and then you have the prow of a ship at the bottom. I'll show you another coin. Um, which has the same legend and um, has the same shaking hands, but without the standard and the prow of the ship. Uh, and this is common. This imagery appears through the various emissions in Nerva's reign. Um, early in his reign, the type with the standard and prow is more common, um, but as his reign progresses, this type on the right without that appears more frequently. So it seems that die engravers just have a tendency to abbreviate the iconography and make it less complicated as time goes on. Nonetheless, this was overall a pretty important image uh, in Nerva's reign because, uh, or a message in Nerva's reign, and we'll go back to the camera again, because uh, it appears on various other uh, denominations. In fact, it appears also on the Sesterci, the Dupondii, and the Azes. So all of your standard imperial denominations. This is an Az from 96, uh, again, just showing the shaking hands. So it's an abbreviated one without the standard. Uh, the Azes uh, among the bronze coins tend to be more abbreviated than the Dupondii and the Sesterci. The Sesterci always show the standard in prow. And then I'll show you now the Dupondius. Um, if I remember correctly, the Dupondius can show either just the hands or the hands with the standard in prow, although typically uh, you get more of the standard in the prow uh, on the Dupondii. So, as I say, uh, this seems to have been a pretty important uh, or uh, common message on nervous coinage, because first of all, it appears on all of the standard denominations, uh, but it also is pretty common in fines. Uh, so if you look at my second bullet point here, uh, the imagery makes up 32% of Dupondi uh, from the Mainz Taunus Veterau Lime system, which is around modern Mainz in Frankfurt, Germany. The reason I studied that area is not because I was working there, but because there's actually a very well recorded um, number of sites and the coins are well, very well identified and documented. So it's a pretty substantial um, uh, corpus we can get from that region. Um, the Garonne Horde, which is a very large horde, uh, it's about 23%. Uh, the Azes from the city of Rome of nervous types, about a third of them are of this type. Um, and overall, there are many different fine complexes and things I studied. Um, you're looking around 25% to a, about a third of nervous bronze coinage uh, were of this type. Um, and I don't know, I don't think I put it in my notes here. But on the uh, denarii, I believe this is also the third or fourth uh, most common type on the on the silver coins as well. The gold is much harder to quantify just because we we don't have as much well documented gold from hordes and and finds. It's mostly uh, silver and bronze that comes up. So again, we have the the negativistic interpretations coming through in in the scholarly sources and scholarly interpretations. So most scholars insist that these types um, were directed at a military audience as some sort of desperate plea. 
you know, let's all get along, right? Let's not have civil war uh, being the message in this kind of interpretation. However, according to fines and hordes, I could find no geographical targeting or distribution. They were just as common in militarized zones as they were in, the, in, in, in long pacified areas such as Aquitania and Gaul or even in the city of Rome. So um, this seems to have a, been a message that was consumed by audiences throughout the Western Roman Empire. Um, and here I just want to highlight some examples of how this has been understood. So Mattingly described the type as dangerously apologetic. Griffin called them wishful thinking. That is, in reality, not everybody was getting along. Uh, Granger described them as part hope and part gratitude once the armed forces would not uh, challenge his rule. And Brennan called them frantic sloganeering. Um, again, I think, uh, you know, we need to look at all of this in a broader context. Um, and also remember that this imagery first appeared at the beginning of Nerva's reign, um, before there is any clear evidence that Nerva had any kind of strained relationship with the Praetorians or the armed forces, remembering again that the scholarly consensus is, is that the commanders must have been um, supportive of Nerva, at least very early on. Uh, and we also know that the Praetorian uh, commander um, was supporting Nerva because he was involved in the plot of uh, Domitian. This is the one that Nerva later replaced when he became emperor and that was later executed when the subsequent Praetorian commander um, demanded uh, the conspirators to be handed over for punishment. Uh, but again, looking at this in a broader context, you do see similar types having been used in the civil wars, which leads to this interpretation that they were wishful thinking or dangerously apologetic. But you also have them struck in times of peace. Vespasian and Titus strike uh, types with uh, the phrase either fides exercitum or concordia exercitum. I can't remember which off the top of my head. Um, but these are several years into their reign. There is no civil strife, uh, although there is, of course, active military campaigns. Um, but even in the reigns of emperors that we think of having been relatively well established and supported and without much military activity, we can see the slogan Concordia Exercitum. And I show you two examples here, the Cistercius of Hadrian, um, with Concordia holding two standards and the phrase Concordia exercitum around her. And then you also see the Cistercius of Antoninus Pius, whose reign is known for peace um, with this imagery of Concordia exercitum. And of course, neither Hadrian nor Antoninus Pius had any fear of civil war. So again, I think we have to look at all of this in the broader visual context and not you know, with our blinders on, looking at just Nerva and thinking about these later historical color sources who who color our view. Um, you know, in the broader context, this this imagery is appropriate and um, standard, I think. And, and just to show you how far this goes. Um, in the fall of 97, after victories against the Suebi, uh, were announced in Rome, and this is the same occasion when Nerva um, stands on the steps of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus and turns to the crowd and names Trajan to be his son and successor. Um, both he and Trajan take the title of Germanicus, um, and you actually see G-E-R-M for Germanicus on his coins uh, struck in 97 and 98, that is the fifth and sixth emissions of his reign. And uh, one scholar has characterized this adoption of the title of Germanicus and its presence on the coinage as flattery directed at the legions. And of course, uh, you study coins, you study Roman history, you think about broader context, you know that it is 
um, common for emperors to take the names of area uh, of areas of peoples that they've they've conquered um, so or defeated so emperors commonly took titles like germanicus for example for example uh, domitian took the title germanicus in 83 after his own victories against the chatii and then of course after victories in britain claudius took the title of britannicus or he didn't take the title of britannicus it was offered to him but he refused it and gave it to his infant son instead. So why do scholars tend to have this um, negativistic kind of interpretation of the military types on nervous coinage? And I think it has, uh, it's part of a broader research problem that um, um, one can identify in, in um, studies of Roman art over the past hundred years or more, which is that we have a tendency of mo as modern people to read the biases of literary historical sources into visual art, even though visual art were operated very differently than um, than um, Roman history, uh, than literary, literary sources did. So um, one famous example of this is at the Glyptotech in Copenhagen. Um, up until relatively recently, it was common for one to go into the galleries and for the docents to point out this famous portrait of Caligula here on the left and to say, you all know Caligula is crazy, right? And that he was mad and he did all of these things that the historical sources tell us about. And you can look at his portrait here and you can see he's crazy, right? So we're trying to read what we know about him into his portrait, psychological portraiture. Um, so first of all, it's debatable how accurate the historical sources are about Caligula and all of his uh, doings. But secondly, um, contemporary visual art would have never presented Caligula as maniacal or crazy or anything like that. Uh, the reason this portrait looks a little uh, off-putting to us is because of the remnant of paint, uh, particularly on his left eye here. Um, and of course, we all know now that Roman portraits were vividly painted. Uh, and in fact, here's on the right, the reconstruction of this. And when you see it digitally reconstructed to look how it appeared originally, um, he looks like a sweet college student, right? Um, he doesn't look crazy or mad or anything else. So, you know, we have to think about these things differently. And I also just want to emphasize again that we should not be surprised that Nerva, who had no military experience himself and who came from the Senate, um, you know, not only was he not unique in Roman history uh, in that regard, but he was emperor, he was imperator, imperator, our modern, or em, imperator, the Latin word from which we get the modern word emperor, uh, has a military connotation. It's a general. It was a title of a general. Um, and so military leadership by virtue of his role of emperor uh, was one of his primary functions. He was the supreme military commander. Um, and all of his military types are modeled on traditional and historical precedents, uh, including the Concordia Exerconum types, which uh, were very uh, widely circulated. and. Um, while we don't have surviving portraits of Nerva as uh, as a general, as well, wearing military ar armor, uh, Hadrian, whose reign was relatively peaceful uh, compared to some other emperors, most of his portraits show him in military dress, as you see here. And then, of course, Antoninus Pius, uh, who who's again his his reign are very was very peaceful. You see him often on. Uh, medallions, for example, wearing military armor and dress, referring to his role as a commander. Um, so again, th th these kinds of things 
highlight their function, even though they may not be out on the battlefield actively campaigning themselves. So anyway, um, that's what I have for you today. I'm happy to take questions. Again, uh, there's the discount code if you're interested in the book. And then uh, in the next, um, there's also the schedule for you for April 5th and May 30th, uh, 31st, if you'd like to tune in then to learn more about Nerva. And we'll probably, again, as I say, talk more about frequencies uh, in some of these uh, later talks. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Hi. Yes. I have a question about the uh, Concordia ex circuitum type that you addressed. And I've always been um, uh, a little curious why we do not see that type on the coinage of Trajan. Um, I know it appears on some other emperors, but uh, it, it just, I, I'm wondering whether there's some negative impl implication that comes from that that he doesn't have it on his coinage, but it's prevalent with Nerva. You know, I really don't know. Um, you know, it, I, I think that's a hard question in general to answer is why something doesn't appear. Um, uh, we do see it in Hadrian's reign though, which is curious. So what's the difference there? I'm, I'm not really sure. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, both had military campaigns but why does one image or the other appear? Uh, you know, in Trajan's coins, um, you get a lot more kind of specificity with types that refer to certain conquered peoples uh, and so on. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't know. It's, it's a good question, but not one I can answer. Um, Nathan? Yep. So Nerva had a very short reign and he was uh, quite an elderly man when he became emperor. So do you think that all these references to victories, packs, and, and so forth may translate a form of uh, personal lack of um, security? Uh, after all, several of his predecessors had been murdered and I, I guess he wanted to avoid such a fate. Mm -hmm. I don't think they refer to personal security in any particular way. Again, they're 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 all pretty standard uh, victory. It's what appears on a Quinarius. He strikes Quinarii. Uh, peace is what appears when a new emperor takes power, whether it's a peaceful transition or not. So I think they're just part of the standard iconographic repertoire. I don't think they have anything to do with his his age or or health or anything like that in particular. <laughs>